right, welcome all. This is from Chaos to Craftsmanship, design patterns that up, up uh, what is it, elevate your Drupal development. Um, today we're going to talk about design patterns. And those are those tried and true solutions that you use for coding conundrums. Uh, it's about making easy to maintain readable and predictable code. And while this session is just an introduction, I hope you leave here just curious about implementing this in your own work. Uh, just out of a show of hands, uh, who here uh, regularly uh, works in object-oriented programming? All right, I got my right people here. If that is not familiar to you, I am going to go over some of the basics, mostly so we can get a, a handle on the vocabulary. Um, this this session is probably still of interest, but come back to it later. Once you once you hit a couple of problems in your object-oriented world, come back to this and go, oh, now I understand the problem I'm solving. My name is Jim Romero, and I'm an engineer at Four Kitchens. I have, I don't know, almost 15 years Drupal dev experience, and I use the framework for all my nerdy hobbies from uh, building arcade projects to running calculations for home brewing beer to uh, planning for the zombie apocalypse at our local summer camps where we teach kids how to be nature experts. Uh, Drupal's been a part of everything I do. Uh, if you have questions after this session, uh, reach out to me. I would love to keep talking shop with you. I am NGIM on all the things, including the Drupal.org Slack. So let's keep talking. And why this topic? Uh, simply because someone's already solved your problem. Uh, as developers, we tend to sometimes even feel like we're in a rut solving the same problem over and over again. And you know, we start to wonder why are we reinventing the wheel, especially if somebody else already has a solution. And that's sort of the idea of design patterns. It's not the precise solution, it's how to organize your code to solve a particular type of problem. It's about promoting reusability by having tried and true solutions. Someone can look at it and go, yep, I understand how that was done. It's about um, making your code more maintainable and organized because everything's stored in a very predictable way. It's about building for scalability so that your code can, can grow over time and you're not you know, cursing yourself for the tech debt you built in on day one. And it's about embodying best practices. If somebody has found a tried and true way to do something, as a community, we almost owe it to ourselves to try to adopt that and work within those frameworks so that everyone else can maintain that tried and true solution. I'm gonna use some scary computer science words today. That's not my background. So uh, please don't be put off by polymorphism or instantiation. Uh, these are just computer science words. We're gonna go through it slowly. We're not gonna talk about the computer science of it all, but really this is about organizing code more than the code itself. I'll try to show some examples at the end, but truly we can look at this in boxes and it doesn't matter what language you're, you're presenting this in, JavaScript, PHP, Ruby, Go. You're gonna use these same design patterns in pretty much all your work as long as you're coming from an object-oriented point of view, that's, that's where I'm approaching today's talk. I also really enjoy these talks because they help me get over my own imposter syndrome. Something about learning to talk the talk uh, makes you part of the inside track. And all of a sudden you can participate in these conversations on a higher level. And uh, I guess some of my examples from other industries is if you're a short order cook, you might be saying, you know, I had to write these down. Give me a walk in a park with a cow over the fence and a stack of Johnny Cakes with a twist. I don't know what that means, but maybe you're a short order cook and you do. Uh, or a football coach might call for uh, setting up a cover two inverted zone with a man under. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Chess is more my speed. Uh, so maybe facing the English opening, blacks one E6 and two D6 laid the groundwork for the hedge system. Uh, or if you're a music fan, you might just say, hey, we're going to jam, give me 12 bar blues riff in B, and there's going to be a call and response. Um, you don't need to know what any of these things are to be successful in these areas, but once you learn to talk the talk, it's a shorthand for something that's accepted in your community. What does that mean, and, and how, do we, um, how can we all participate with limited knowledge? Oh, cool, 12 bar blues in B, got it. Uh, so this language also translates into our area, especially writing back-end code, but I see it growing more and more, uh, especially with JavaScript's influence in a lot of our frameworks. Uh, we have our own shorthand, and so I might look at someone's module and just kind of peek and go, oh, okay, that's an abstract factory, and we have resources loaded through dependency injection. I know how to use that. Uh, and there's hundreds of patterns. I'm, I'm just going to mention a few of them today. They usually get grouped into these three categories. Creational patterns like factory builder, prototype, singleton is usually one of the first ones you'll encounter. Structural patterns like the ad adapter, bridge, proxy, and behavioral patterns, that's the one I'll start with, with the strategy, state, observer, iterator, command. Um, all these patterns do interesting things and it's, it's, it's kind of addictive once you start learning about them because you have to figure out what the right tool for the job is. 
But at its core, there's probably five or six I use regularly in my Drupal work. So it's not something you have to be on the quest for more and more knowledge. Um, it's fun. It's fun to learn. Why is one more efficient? Why is one better suited for a job? So I, I said we would cover some of the object-oriented basics, and I want to go through the four pillars of object-oriented programming, uh, just as a refresher and kind of re-influence that. I'm not going to put a lot of code on the screen, but when I do, it's it's actually something you could apply to any language, even though this is PHP. So let's talk abstraction. That is this idea that you can take functionality and um, uh, I better read the definition. I wrote it down for a reason. Um, so uh, the main purpose of abstraction is to hide unnecessary details from the user. So the object only shows what's essential. You know, object-oriented programming isn't something you turn on. It's, it's more of a paradigm. It's something you, 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 you walk into and you start to figure out how to use it. Abstraction is just one of those, but it doesn't do anything on its own. So for the most part, we say, okay, I have an automobile, and this car can do lots of things under the hood. There's a fuel injector. There's, there's going to create a spark. Throttles open. Brake pads move. Steering wheel moves. But not all those things our end user does. They don't hit a button to say, uh, you know, hit the spark plug at this time and they're tapping away at the right timing. Um, instead, they're going to act through some other public function, turn the car on, push, push on the brake, turn the steering wheel. So of all the things this automobile could do, some things are public, some things are private, and often this comes through abstraction. Uh, the other one that this is very closely related to is encapsulation. We start to model things in code based on how we think about them in the real world. And this actually sometimes leads to really giant objects because it's like, hey, it all fits. It's all a family. Let's put it in there. For some reason, computer science books love to make everything about like animals. Here is an animal, and here is a dog, and a dog has legs. How many legs does a dog have? Four. Tell me another property of a dog. It goes to heaven. They all do. So, um, you know, here's my video game example. Uh, there's some private properties here, health and stamina, but there's also some public ones. So my my character can walk, run, jump, punch, kick. Um, all of these things together are describing something in the real world, and that's generally what we talk about with encapsulation. The third one is inheritance, and this is the one where we usually start to break things with like the best of intentions. Uh, I, I love pasta. It's my daughter's favorite meal. So let's talk about pasta types. Inheritance can be real hierarchical. Oh, that's a tough word. Um, where, let's say, pasta can have a variety of long pasta, like fettuccine or spaghetti or filled pasta like ravioli or tortellini. There's some really great flow charts. If you're, if you're hungry, you can check them out. But the idea is here is there's a hierarchical ooh, relationship as you go from parents to grandparents, and they're going to take properties from that parent and apply to all of the children. You can also have inheritance through things like an interface. So let's say I have an interface that's electric powered, and that could apply to a lot of things, from hand tools to, in this case, an automobile. I have an interface for a truck, and a truck could be a lot of things. It could be a Toy Tonka truck. It could be a, a, you know, a large piece of construction equipment or a consumer vehicle. But in this case, I have an automobile. It's the Silverado EV, which is going to extend automobile and implement electric powered and truck. So this is the inheritance piece. And like I said, this is where things start to go off the rails. As you start combining things, you're creating sets of rules where sometimes you feel doomed to fail. And you're like, why am I even doing this? This was easier just to write out all my code in one big line. And then the last one is polymorphism. Maybe, maybe one of the uh, funkier ones to think about. Uh, it's not one we meditate on too often, but it will surface in the design pattern world. Uh, we're talking about how you can address the same sort of thing uh, through a set of op uh, 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 through different objects. So in this case, uh, regardless which pet I have, I have a greeting function, and the dog's going to say woof, and the snake's going to say hiss, and the cat's going to give a judgmental stare. They all have a greeting that's important to them. Uh, so that's part of our polymorphism definition. All right, I, I promise this is the last part of computer science. Let's do it. Objects and classes, and then we can break them. Um, this is, this is entry-level object-oriented programming. I have a class. Class is called Duck. Welcome. We're starting a new company. We're making duck apps now. That's what we're going to do for the next seven minutes. And in our duck app, we need to have lots of ducks on it. So we used object-oriented programming. Uh-oh, that's not good. Okay, well, any room monitor things I need to change anything? Stop the code, start it, and eh, who knows? Red light's, red light's still there. I'll keep going. Um, so I have my duck, and I want to make several ducks, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I am going to create a class. 
but a class isn't a thing in memory. It's a template. It's a cookie cutter. So to actually have a duck, my duck Donald, I say Donald equals new duck, and now I have a duck, and I can display that duck, and it appears on my iPhone app. Cool, I have a duck. And maybe I create another one, Daisy Duck, and that one's there. I could have Huey, Dewey, and Louie. As many objects as I want to instantiate from that class. That's pretty easy, but this app is not ready for the trade show yet. We got to make it a little more complicated. Let's make sure our ducks can do some things. Now, they're all going to display a little different. Um, these are two varieties of ducks, a mallard duck and a redhead duck. I want to tap them on my app. It opens it up. They have a different display, but every single one of them is going to quack, swim, and fly. And so this is the, the classic, why am I using object-oriented programming? This is the classic example, and this is what we're taught usually, and then we stop learning, and we get ourselves in trouble. <coughs> so uh, I guess the only takeaway here is I can't create a duck directly because I'm using an abstract base class. In Drupal, you almost always see the word base as a keyword when we're talking about something that's abstract. Um, so you'll see that if I have some time, I'll, I'll show some examples. Um, but yeah, I can't create a duck uh, explicitly because I need that abstract display. So I can create a mallard, I can create a redhead duck. Cool, I'm ready for the trade show. Unbeknownst to myself, there is a whole team of engineers working on other ducks for this trade show. And this is where it starts to fall apart because they've added the rubber duck and the decoy duck, which is great. You can push, they can add to the screen, and now I have my rubber duck and my decoy duck. They're on my app, but that rubber duck is quacking. Rubber ducks don't quack? And that decoy duck is flying. That thing's supposed to be wood. It's supposed to be sitting on the ground. So neither of these things are, are doing what they're supposed to do. And it's because my duck class said, all ducks can swim, all ducks can quack, all ducks can fly. And it's like, that's just object-oriented programming. That's my abstraction. It's my encapsulation. But clearly, all ducks don't swim, and all ducks don't fly. And so we find ourselves in this cycle of, oh, what am I supposed to do? And what we almost always end up doing is overriding things. Like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm doing a hot fix at the trade show. Uh, the CEO is mad at me because I have a rubber duck flying around the screen. Rubber ducks can't fly. And so I rewrite my rubber duck to say, I know you think you can fly, but you can't. You can't. I mean, technically all ducks can, but the rubber duck. And same with the decoy. Like, you can't quack. You can't fly. So, yeah, you, you inherited it from your parent, but we're going to take that off here. There's a lot of ways you can override things. I'm just kind of shorthanding it to say, don't trust the parent. And this is called the fragile base class problem. It's, it's where a lot of people will start to give up on object-oriented programming or really just kind of throw it through you know, the mud and say, look at this awful thing we're creating. And it, this is awful because as more teams try to use this, they're going to learn, oh, we have this duck class. It's right some of the time. And sometimes you have to override what it does. And who's keeping track of where all these things are overridden? If somebody adds, uh, a, if someone makes a change to how quacks work, I need to find anyone that's overridden how that quack works to update the individual child. And if you're into a place where there's multiple types of inheritance, a large number of objects, this is just like a weird exercise in bookkeeping to keep track of all of the objects that relate to each other. When do the rules apply? When don't they? You're leaving a bunch of comments. There has to be a better way. Any questions right now? Like this was all just object-oriented programming. It's going to get a little weirder. Let's add a design pattern. First thing you should note is I just added a lot of boxes to this display um, to the point where anyone coming from Drupal 7 to modern Drupal, you might have been like, why do I need all these files? I used to just put things in a dot module, right? It's, it's sometimes uncomfortable to see all that boilerplate. Uh, it, it feels like you, there's this huge learning curve, and that's actually the same feeling you're going to have with design patterns. It's writing a lot of code to do exactly what I was doing before. I also want to mention that um, at Four Kitchens, we have these practice groups. I lead a bunch of them where I get to teach different uh, engineering principles, and we all share. And I spent a, an hour going from here to here. Well, you just got it as a slide. So while I have the code examples and I'll share it with you, I can't go through it all. I'm just going to talk about the takeaways. What are the things that we did that work really well and define this strategy pattern? Well, the word strategy, you could also maybe call a behavior or an algorithm. And it's just saying that when you want to do something, there might be multiple ways to accomplish it. So uh, I've created a quack behavior, a quack strategy, a quack algorithm. You can keep using those words because depending on the context, it might mean something different. And I realized that some of my ducks are going to quack. Some of my ducks are going to squeak like the rubber duck, right? And some of my ducks are mute. The wood duck doesn't make any noise. Every duck has a quack behavior because of the interface, but they have to pick which one. It's not something that's automatically inherited from their parent. So for a strategy pattern, you take the thing that's changing, you encapsulate it, and you apply it on a per-class basis. 
or through some other maybe factory method or something else that is going to assemble these ducts so that each one of the concrete instances takes one of the available strategies. Likewise with the fly, I have two different fly behaviors. Uh, winged fly, flight, so ducks are going to fly versus no fly. I mean, I guess you could throw the rubber duck, but that doesn't really, really count. Uh, what's nice about this approach is we've, uh, I, I had to write this one down too. So the strategy lets you vary independently from clients that use it. So instead of thinking of duck behaviors as just a set of behaviors, they become considered a family of behaviors and that they can be reused. The, that definition didn't help me at all. <laughs> uh, what I think is, is important here is the next time the CTO wants to add something to our duck simulator and we're told, yeah, our duck app now has geese. We need a goose. And this goose is going to honk. This is a very easy addition for us to make. We can add the new geese, the, the new goose type, so class goose extends duck, and we just add a new quack behavior, and this is honk. So we're able to take the thing that varies, this small sliver of thing, and give it its own interface and just change that one. You can add and remove these. The thing that vary, things that varied are kind of put off to the side, and you can add and remove them as needed. That is my like super basic introduction to the strategy pattern. I don't expect everyone to remember this or be able to implement it, but I will show you some books that can teach you. Any questions on this before I introduce another one? I, I fully expect if you're not used to design patterns that this is this is a lot to take in uh, and you might be saying, yeah, but why would I use it? Uh, I encourage you just to trust the process. Uh, give it a shot. Try to find a place in your code. I'll make the speech again at the end. Uh, maybe some concrete examples will help. Uh, when I'm on Reddit, there's a way to sort the posts. You can sort by new, hot, top, and controversial. Uh, these are just four different algorithms for sorting a series of posts. You know, just like you might have ascending order, descending order, sort by author, whatever they may be. It's the same Reddit app, it's the same interface, but we've changed just one component. So just like our ducks, we can vary the quacks. On our Reddit sort, we can vary the algorithm that changes how those posts are sorted. For an online payment, this is another popular use case if you're just looking at examples online. I go to, to do a, a checkout, I could have one monolithic file in my dot module that says, okay, if using PayPal, here's how to process it. If using Venmo, here's how to process it. If Apple Pay, here's how to process it. Or I can take each one of those payment processors and make them their own interface, payment gateway, and then I can hot swap them. And then inevitably when someone comes up with a new payment processor, uh, we just add it to the list and that's our new strategy behavior. So a new algorithm gets gone. And the last one that I actually think about quite regularly with this pattern is Google Maps because uh, it's just sort of a classic algorithm like solving a maze. That's a classic computer science algorithm. And that's kind of what Google Maps is doing, right? Trying to get you from point A to point B with some set of criteria. But you can swap out what algorithm it's using. If I'm driving, it's going to keep me on the streets. I appreciate that. But if I'm walking, I might take a path. It might cut me through some, some places based on, I don't know, how it decides where I'm allowed to walk, but places cars can't go. It also might decide I can't go on the highway because I'm walking. And right, likewise, it has algorithms for ride share, for public transit. So same application has four or more strategies, and you're able to hot swap those algorithms if they want to come up with a new one, maybe there's, there's uh, I think so there is one for flight, but there's a flight button. They can add that and not worry about having to update any of the other algorithms. They're independently encapsulated. Why is this relevant? Drupal people, that's sort of something that's always hard to make this stuff tangible. It's like, yeah, but I have work to do. Uh, you're already using these in some places. Uh, so take a chance, uh, see where you can use it in your work, but at least dig into the existing code. Uh, twig cache strategies, in fact, cache strategies in general usually find themselves in this place. I want to cache something on my local file system. Uh, I don't want to cache things. That's that idea of like a duck doesn't quack. I need an answer to say don't do this thing too, but at least now I've encapsulated it as a strategy. Search is another very popular one. I want my Drupal site to have a search, and that's, that's an interface, and we know how search works, and you can create a view with it, and you can do all sorts of things with the search, clear the caches, uh, run an indexing. But what's on the back end of that search? So Solar, Elasticsearch, the database search, some sort of search API-backed one. This, this is another example of a strategy pattern. Or local file handling. So I'm using just my site's default files directory, or I want to have all my files in an S3 bucket, or I want to use the, the, the production proxy cache module, sorry, I don't know the name of that one, where I just am pulling the files from production, even though I'm on a, a dev. Uh, these are swapping the, the file access strategies. Drupal's pretty unaware of it. You've just said, uh, instead use this, and it's gonna support all the same methods. 
So that's my first pattern. Uh, I'm going to talk about really just two more uh, and then hopefully have some time for some examples. The, the next one that I think is most relevant to Drupal folks is factories. And it's because you're going to see it all over the place in our Drupal code. Uh, there's a couple of different versions of factory. So the first one I'm going to show is a simple factory, which generally we don't do, but is the one that's often talked about if you start Googling for articles on this subject. And for this factory, I own a pizza shop and I want to create a bunch of pizzas. Uh, and I want to do it not just here, but in multiple locations. So I need predictability. So doing the same object-oriented programming rules, I am trying to encapsulate things, abstract things, uh, and eventually when I scale this out, have that polymorphism where every shop can bake a pie, et cetera, cut the pie. Uh, so let's just start simple. I have a pizza. has methods on it. I can repair it, bake it, cut it, box it. And I need to like change what kind of pizza I'm making here. So I'm going to set a cheese, set a crust, set toppings, maybe override all those. This is a barbecue pizza. Ignore whatever they said uh, the sauce was. We're using this barbecue sauce or some variation thereof. Uh, so a pizza has a bunch of methods, and I need to make this into some sort of system for handling lots of different pizzas. So in my example here, anyone else like love pizza this much that like the, I had a hard time figuring out what needed to go on this slide. Uh, Oops, all pineapple is my favorite because I hope some of you just took it to heart. Um, so I have a bunch of pizzas here. I have cheese, veggie, pepperoni, barbecue. You can read that. Uh, and I need a way to make these. And this happens a lot in our code when we're working on a series of things that are similar. And the goal of these creational patterns is usually to get us to stop using the new keyword. I don't want to say new cheese pizza, new veggie pizza, new pepperoni pizza. Two things are happening. One, uh, we're building code that's not very testable. Uh, by creating this new object. There's, there's other ways to organize the instantiation of an object to things, make things more shareable, to make things um, easier to debug, easier to uh, watch for memory leaks. Okay. Um, and then uh, the second thing that's happening is we're, we're building this for, for scale. Uh, you might have been in a place where you do have a series of classes because you're doing things object-oriented, and you have to have a big switch or an if statement. If cheese, then new cheese pizza. If veggie, then new veggie pizza. If pepperoni, then new pepperoni pizza. You can still do that in a factory, but the goal here, once we get past the simple factory, is to not have to hard code every possible pizza and to find every single step for every pizza. We want to make, make this a little more automated. So this is a simple factory. I have something called the pizza factory that knows how to make a pizza. And then I have two locations, New York and Chicago. And they have their own cheeses, their own sauce, their own doughs, their own set of specialty pies, uh, and they can create pizzas from there. Uh, I think I have one more slide to kind of make this a little more complicated, uh, because that was a simple factory, but it has the same fragile base class issues. How can we make this thing maybe a little more abstract, use some design patterns? This is the factory method, and this is where it started to hit for me when I started getting into Drupal core uh, code and looking at how some factories work, especially if you do anything with custom plugins, you'll start to see the power of this or you might have a bunch of different field types and you want to group them all together and pick the right one at the right at runtime. So uh, here's my pizza factory. I have uh, a pizza factory for New York, a pizza factory for Chicago, and instead of saying I want a cheese pizza and I, or I want a barbecue pizza or I want oops all pineapple, I am going to create an interface for all the things that vary, uh, and that's the dough and the sauce and the cheese in this example. And I am going to, uh, at runtime, let my pizza factory figure out which one of those to use. So if someone says, I want a barbecue pizza, it's going to assemble that using the factory. You're never saying, I want a new cheese pizza. You're saying, no, pizza factory, I want a pizza, and it's going to have deep dish, marinara, and uh, mozzarella cheese. Uh, once again, I'm going over this very fast. This merits its own hour explanation. But uh, what I think is a fun takeaway of this, uh, yeah, good, I have a picture, is we are going to have menus that vary. And this is true for the code we write. We want our code to be reusable. And so in this case, my code being used at the Chicago Pizza Restaurant, if you order a cheese pizza, you're getting plum tomato sauce versus the New York restaurant, you're getting marinara sauce. It's still the same process. You are still baking, cutting, slicing, whatever those methods were. We've just swapped out what ingredients are available at the individual factory. So this is the method pattern, factory method pattern. Uh, and it allows us to reuse this clam pizza for some of y'all work with those people. Um, they made me eat it. Um, it was good. 
so this is, uh, let's see, we got the same product, dough, sauce, cheese, veggies, but different implementations based on the region. Uh, that's the factory method, and it's, this is a very popular one. You're going to see it uh, in, in our query work. Most of the time we're using MySQL, so the SQL query method, but you can swap this out for Postgres, key value store, even flat files if you really wanted to. Drupal can be fairly agnostic. This is different from, this is a behavioral pattern. It's different from, or, no, this is a creational pattern. I just have the, the tagline on there wrong. Uh, it's different from the strategy one. The strategy was varying how things changed. This is varying more of the properties of how things are built and organized. Uh, so form handlers, the way the forms are built, the plugin factories, uh, if you create a series of blocks, every one of those blocks is going to probably be managed in a factory. The same with our field formatters, the same with our, I think, our date formatters. So factories are behind all of this. And there's a lot more patterns. Uh, singleton. Let me just go over these three and then maybe show off some code. Singleton is one of the first ones you might learn. Actually, no. Let me quick ask. Sorry. Is there anything I would like to ask about strategies or factories before I move on? Well, it's top of mind. All right. Let me introduce three more then. Uh, singleton might be the first one you learn. It's a great one to learn because uh, if you're new to this, you'll have some odd aha moments. I was working on a site at a previous job and inside a block, somebody had called a variable that was never defined anywhere. And I was like, where did this variable come from? Why does this exist? And it's because I didn't know about the singleton pattern. Some other part of my site created uh, a, a variable that I didn't know existed. And that just blew my mind that you can have a variable available later on in the life cycle of PHP. I'm usually thinking things execute in order, the script's done, it's done. So Singleton having the ability to um, keep things alive for a long period of time, or be able to share back data, be able to limit your memory footprint, is a really neat academic exercise. But in all honesty, it's kind of an anti-pattern. There's a lot of things wrong with a Singleton. It's great at a lot of things. It is the right tool for the job sometimes, but it makes it harder to test, makes it harder to sort of break into. So often, if you're working in, in Symfony, Drupal, you're gonna use something like the service container because that's gonna do something very similar. It's a template, and if you instantiate a logger in the service container, a database connection, you only have to do it once. Uh, every time you look at the database, it's not creating a new thing in memory. If 100 blocks need to access the database, it doesn't create 100 database connections. It just keeps reusing that one, and that's the principle of the singleton. The second is the plugin. Like I said, this is usually paired with a factory to make the plugins, but this is a lot of fun, and you'll see it in blocks and widgets and fields. In Drupal, we usually see those plugin annotations uh, that's, that's sort of related to the plugin pattern. And the observer pattern is one that I wish I knew more about. Uh, the only time I've used it in anything recent was in validation, so that I don't have to write validation rules on every single form on my site. If I know that my form has a password field, it's going to have a validation uh, associated with it. Or if it has a field that has required text or some sort of relationship, like it has to have at least two items in this field, uh, or date validation. Um, applying that through observation becomes uh, a lot easier than just sort of brute force putting it in every single form on your site. So uh, I encourage you to check these out. And if you want to learn more about them, this is my go-to guide. Uh, Head first design patterns. Uh, if you've never used a book in this Head First series, it may or may not be for you. They try to be funny. I like that. Not everyone does. So they have a lot of um, illustrations, silly stories. They'll repeat the same concept over and over again uh, to where the point you're like, Did, didn't you say this twice already? That's part of their teaching strategy to show things from a different perspective or make it memorable. But I know some people hate that. They want the cut and dry. So head first design patterns, large book, but it helps with examples, and my pizza example and my duck example both came from that book. The only other caveat on that book that if you want to like work through these is a, a sort of professional development experience. Um, it is written in Java, but object-oriented is object-oriented. You'll figure it out. And if not, there are people who put their examples online. You can get PHP, JavaScript, whatever code you want to work in. They've translated this book to that as well. The second one is design patterns, elements of reusable object-oriented software. This is uh, called the Gang of Four book. The, the authors of this are just, they're the authority. This is the one everyone comes back to. It's the desktop reference. It is very dry. It is not going to teach you. It is more of a reference than anything else. But uh, it is a good one to have in your library, especially if you find yourself using these patterns regularly and you're trying to remember, wait, why do I use this one versus that one? And of course, the internet has a ton of stuff on there. Uh, Refactoring.guru is one of my favorites, but there's a number of sites that talk about design patterns because it's just very popular in the, uh, 
networks of people job searching. It's like design patterns, algorithms, and, and, and these sorts of things uh, for, I guess, for interview tests for lo especially large tech companies. So refactoring.guru is one of my favorites. It has a lot of visualizations of how different design patterns work and can help explain them to you in a way where you're not buried in code, but then they will let you click through to see some more code examples. So I suggest all of those, and we, we've been working through these uh, here and there at Four Kitchens just so people are more familiar with them. All right, I talked a lot. I want to look at some code. Hopefully this will work. I'm having some problems. Uh, we'll see if I can get my VS Code up and running. Uh, but I have three things to look at, and I was going to pull the group, but I didn't think this bigger group would come. This is exciting. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just I'll follow my heart. <laughs> so the three things we can do, uh, we can look at the examples of what I've already shown. Uh, strategy, I actually have a really good singleton one. That might be worth exploring. The second is we can look in Drupal core but that one might not be as, as relevant. Uh, I would just encourage you in your IDE or wherever, throw the word fac factory in there and see how many files pop up. Uh, throw the word base in, you're gonna find your abstract classes. Look at how interfaces are coalescing to make some like complicated objects. Uh, and then finally, just discussing real life strategies, I do wanna leave some time for questions. So uh, yeah, let me just jump right in. Let's take a closer look. I have this repository that I use for my practice group at work. So my name at GitHub, it's ngim slash design patterns. And uh, I, I've organized this so that I can walk people through the lessons. You can see it was a couple of years ago since I started this uh, with my, my development team. And let me actually just go all the way up to the encapsulate part. Let's see what that duck one looks like in practice. Tempted to launch. Now I'm, I'm just going to look at it right in here because I'm too afraid of breaking this screen recording. Uh, I'll just I'll scroll up and down. I was going to put it in VS Code. Uh, we have in this case an abstract duck, and the duck could have one of two behaviors. And those are protected properties right now: a, a, a fly behavior or a quack behavior. And as you remember, when I'm creating a duck, I'm not going to say that this duck can quack. That would, that would be something that's a little too rigid, harder to swap out. It's something that I, I have to figure out later. Instead, when I create my duck, let's scroll down to the bottom. Here is my, I have my mallard duck. I think that's the one that was most exciting here. Here's my mallard duck. It extends duck. And then at creation time, at runtime, I'm saying that it is going to quack as its behavior. So its quack behavior is quack instead of mute or squeak or honk. And its fly behavior is fly with wings. And so this is really the strategy pattern. Uh, if you remember, there was a lot of boxes. There's a lot of classes on this thing. But this has allowed us to be organized so that the next person to pick up this work, if they're familiar with the design patterns, can say, oh, that's a strategy design pattern. I just need to add a new behavior. And then I won't break any of the existing code. Likewise, here's my red, wet, red head duck. It's going to be very similar. But my rubber duck. Squeaks, doesn't quack, it does not fly, I guess it can be thrown. And my decoy duck is mute, it doesn't fly. The other part with uh, sort of object-oriented object -oriented best practices is every one of these things is back behind an interface. It took me a long time to understand what that means. Anybody else here, like, uh, uh, what's the phrase? Program for, an interface, program against the interface, but they always say encapsulation over inheritance, is that the phrase? Um, I took me a long time to figure out what that meant. It was the fragile base class, that if you rely too much on inheritance, you're going to be in that bookkeeping nightmare. So let's take a peek at what, what this squeak behavior would be. Let's scroll up. It goes at the top. So squeak implements quack behavior. Quack implements quack behavior. So all three of these are saying, I am a valid quack behavior. At runtime, I'm allowed to. Uh, I'm allowed to be one of the quack behaviors assigned to a duck. One of them is required, and there it is. It's just saying a quack behavior must have a quack method. So that's that polymorphism. It all comes back around. Um, that's it for strategy. I just wanted to show an example of what that looked like in real PHP code. The other one worth showing off, uh, if I can get it to run, let's see, is uh, an example of a singleton, actually pretty good. There's my VS code. So far, so good. I think Lando is running. I'm using that for PHP. And I would like to 
get my singleton out, university, final. Bear with me, y'all. I don't use this computer often. All my tools are moved. Uh, Lando info. Let's figure out what what the web address is for this project. And this will be my last example. This is a, a real world example from when I worked was working with a higher ed institution that wanted to have a student portal. And we didn't use a singleton, but we needed some sort of persistent database connection. So I will go, actually I will open both of these. So here is the, my starting. This is me not using a singleton. This is the student portal. Um, in this repo you can see all the examples. It's just plain PHP and CSS. I wanted to see an example of a design pattern with all the Drupal stuff kind of in the way. It's hard to learn when you're kind of hiding behind the framework. I just wanted something that was very vanilla. Um, but in this example, I have a student portal and there's lots of little box, box around here. A student has an advisor. Uh, a student is taking some courses, but some courses they completed and they have a grade and that's gonna change what's here. If the student is having any financial issues or you know they haven't paid their bill, I should say. I think I have an alert, I don't remember. Uh, all the things that I did here. Uh, but uh, this is all backed by a MySQL database and so my, all my examples, including the database, are in this repo. And, and uh, the thing, am I on the start here? Um, I am. The, the part that I wanted to, to drill home of what makes this a singleton is let's look at one of these blocks. Uh, so current courses. Is at the start of the current courses, I have a query here and I'm saying, okay, let's get that data. Let's make a new connection to the database and let's query. And, and this is just a simple MySQL query that you would do in PHP. The problem that I have here is, is actually, it has two side effects. One, every single one of these blocks is making a separate connection to the database. That's just hurting our memory usage. There is no reason to maintain these separate database connections. And in fact, depending on how you sort of scope this out or the life cycle of your app, some of this could lead to some real memory leaks. So being able to share that database connection is a big performance boost. The second thing is, you know, the way I've organized my code is every block is its own PHP file. And that means if I want to share data between those things, I don't have a place to store that. I guess I can put something temporarily in the database and retrieve it later, but it, it's kind of difficult. So the beauty of the, the singleton is, uh, I'm sorry, I should have shown the other one first, but let me show the start. Here's the PDO example where I'm creating a new database connection. So that's creating a new one every single time versus current courses where I have this connect object. Where did I put that? Oh, I just say require ones connect.php. This is the singleton. Let's look at what that is. And this is the singleton design pattern. The fun thing about a singleton is it's the only pattern that I use at least, actually I almost never use these, where you can't use the new object. You are not allowed to instantiate a new version of the singleton. If you try to, uh, that's fine. It's gonna, it's just gonna, what, what it's gonna do in a constructor is it's just gonna pass back, in this case, an instance of it already existing. So if I say, I want a new database connection, if that's already been said once, it's gonna say, we already have one, here it is. And so this is not only a way to save memory, but it's a way you can keep persistent memory across the life cycle of a PHP application, which is just a nice benefit. Once again, probably never use this. If you're in Drupal space, you're probably gonna use um, your, your service container to do all this kind of work. Uh, those are a couple of examples. I, I hope this was a good introduction. It's, it's a different world and it's a lot to take on, but I'm hoping this was a good example of like what you can and can't do with design patterns. Uh, I hope this makes you curious and I'm challenging you to maybe try this yourself. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. That's all I got. I'm hoping someone has a question. Just out of curiosity, anyone here use design patterns in their day-to-day -day work? All right, right on. Does anyone have a favorite design pattern that I didn't mention? Because I was, I purposely picked ones that you're gonna see in Drupal core regularly. I've used Singleton a few times, but you know, more Singleton versus the others. So Singleton? 
It's undefeated. People call it an anti-pattern because there's things about it that aren't best practice, but it's still a pattern. It still gets a good job done. So yeah, it, it will always have a special place in my heart because the first time I saw it, I freaked out. I didn't know what it was. Traits are nice. Traits. Yes, traits are allowing us to do all kinds of new things and, and just get organized. All right. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.